Hello. Hello, everybody. How's it going? It is Thursday, May 27th, which means not only that it's time for another episode of TL Talk, but it is the Friday Eve of Memorial Day weekend. Summer is here. I don't know if you guys, Eric, was this a thing with you when you went to college and there was Friday Eve and your weekend began on Thursday? Like it was whatever classes you had on Friday were just, why? You had classes on Friday? That sounds terrible. Usually like one, it was like a lecture, like a big oh, yeah. one. But Friday Eve, like you, you went to the bars on Thursday when you were legal, right? That's the thing. Yeah. Uh, I was never legal during college. True story. I know. Oh wow. I know. We'll Terrible. uncover more on that later, guys. Right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jenny Guy, your Teal Talk host. How is everyone doing today? Hello, Sarah. Hello, everybody else. As you're coming in, are there any plans for Memorial Day weekend? I can't believe it's already Memorial Day. I have a couple of recipes that are calling my name that are not good for you, but will taste amazing. And last night I came to a very important decision regarding my summer plans. The word is charcuterie. Mm. Slice it, stick it on a plate, enjoy. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, 11sies, it's never a bad time for charcuterie. So my important question for my lovely audience today, where do you like to get your charcuterie supplies? Do you get from local? Do you order online? Do you have recipes for your favorite accoutrement? Tell me in the comments and help me make my summer snack dreams come true. Uh, in other news, today is our Teal Talk season three finale. How the heck did that happen? I don't really know. Three whole seasons of me getting paid to talk to experts from around the industry and ask them my questions. And more importantly, ask them your questions. And for our season three finale, we couldn't think of a better person who our audience has more questions for than my guest for today. It is Eric Hochberger, Mediavine CEO and co-founder, programmer, Shitsu lover, and one of my most favorite guests. Eric, welcome to Teal Talk. Thank you for making time for us today. Thank you for having me. I feel like I've had a season finale before, but I love it. Appreciate I it. Think you, I think you always, like, it's, it's tradition. Oh, it's good. traditional. Um, I have a ton of questions for you. I know our audience has them too. Feel free to fire away whenever you guys have them. We will get to them. But firstly, and maybe most importantly, Eric, charcuterie thoughts. Do you have them? Favorite purveyors, favorite items? I'm, I'm mostly trying to think about the charcuterie for breakfast. So is it just like Why breakfast meats and, and yeah. cheese? Okay, yeah. No, I can get behind this. I'm, like, I'm 100% in. I just, I don't think I've ever had a charcuterie that early. Well, you're not, I feel like like brunch charcuterie, right? Yeah, like, no, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, you know, the little brunch buffet, there, there's definitely the makings of charcuterie there. Uh, just, you know, maybe it's up on the buffet. I'm just trying to picture it for myself making one. This is where you're getting me confused. But have you never just like, like in the summer, say that it's hot and you don't want to turn anything on and you don't want cereal. Is there any reason you could not just have some delicious meats and olives in your refrigerator that you can just like cut up and put on a plate and eat? Uh, no, I am in. And uh, that sounds like great breakfast for the children as well. They would love it. This is, it's yeah, easy. This, is easy. this is breakfast all summer. I'm in. You can make it like like mustards. You've got like the olives. If you want to like grill up some veggies, you can have those in the refrigerator. I just think it's just, it solves all the problems that you might have in life. Okay. I'm going to just jump straight in. People are saying, oh, breakfast charcuterie equals European breakfast rolls and jams and Nutella cured meats, fruit, yogurt. Yeah. Yes. I'm here for all of that. I actually, um, am a uh, infamous insomniac. I don't know if I've ever talked about that here, but last night when I couldn't sleep, I was looking up different places to purchase um, artisan meats. So um, that was what was occupying me last night when I was not sleeping. So I am here for all of your suggestions. This is, this is my charcuterie summer and I'm very, very excited about it. I'm gonna go ahead and just jump the gun and jump all of the things. And let's start out, Eric, by talking about our theme framework trellis which we always have questions on and i knew we would inevitably have a question on here which is totally um, valid because we talk about it and have been talking about it for a long time so could you give us some updates on what's going on with everybody's favorite theme framework oh we're just going to start it right off with trellis we're not going to wait till okay it comes in what i wanted to do was in. like okay. was right. like ease you into it by talking about charcuterie and then just go bam trellis ah okay perfect Yes. Perfect to come accoutrement to accoutrement for charcuterie yeah. is trellis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. 
Uh, no, so we have some pretty exciting news uh, with Trellis recently. We just released, I believe it was yesterday, uh, the latest version of Trellis, which is 0 0.13.1. Uh, if those numbers don't mean anything to you, the important thing is that they have fixes for CLS and core web vitals in them. And so we're really excited because a lot of our internal testers that have been using it for the past week or so are now starting to pass core web vitals. So a, a big handful of them. So we already have a bunch of Trello sites passing core web vitals, uh, but this is going to hopefully be the next wave of anyone who has any remaining CLS issues. I won't fix every single CLS issue, obviously, but it will get you passing core web vitals, which is all that matters. Okay, so we have a new release. It came out yesterday for our beta testers who are blowing up the comments and saying, I love it, it's amazing, I love it. Uh, what do they need to do right now? So if you're a beta tester uh, and you feel extra beta-y, uh, update right away because that is one of our warnings during a beta test. Uh, when a new release comes out, that's what you're doing. You're helping find bugs, so there may be bugs, but 0 0.13.1 will definitely bring, I think, a lot more fixes uh, than just CLS as well. So if you're having other issues with your site, I know I've been playing with it on my personal blog that has no actual posts or updates on it, but I've just been playing with it for a chance to play with Trellis and it fixed the one issue I had on that site. So I do think 13.1 is gonna have some good fixes as well, uh, but update, that's the best advice we have right now. Update to 13.1, update to the latest version of Trellis images, which also came out to make sure you're generating web P versions of all your images. And hopefully this should get you passing core web vitals, which I think is what everyone wants in time for the update next month. Okay, now that we have, well, I'm not gonna let y'all put quite that easy on Trellis. Before we move on to a, a larger core web vitals discussion, which we are going to, um, I think we would all love to know, is Trellis going to be open to anyone who wants it soon? And that's a fair question. And I know we've already gotten that in the comments and if we don't address it, it will come. So it is coming soon. I know we wanted to get it out in time before the page experience update. Luckily that is a slow rollout. So even if it does launch in time in June, it does not mean it is impacting your site right away. Remember the last slow rollout, they took up six months uh, for a lot of us to start even getting notices. So uh, I don't think anyone should fret, uh, but our goal with Trellis is get into your hands once it is in a stable position or as stable as it can be. And what we really refer to as stable is when we change things such as what's called the API or the back end of Trellis, uh, such as filters, uh, all that kind of stuff inside of WordPress. If we change that on a bunch of live sites uh, or in a version, a bunch of live sites are gonna be altered. So what we wanna do is get that as stable as possible before we release it to the masses. Because once we open it up, we know that it's gonna increase the number of people running it by a large percentage. So our hope is our next version, which is 0 0.14. Uh, with that is when we're hoping we can open this thing up. So that is coming soon, because uh, 13.1 is now out uh, as of yesterday. Uh, so now that our beta testers will hopefully get their hands on .14 next, that's when I think everyone else can know that good things are coming. Okay, Amy Pelsner says, and I'm going to, after that, we're gonna talk about child themes, but Amy Pelsner says, how do we update? I see the update on the images and the plugin, but not an update for just Trellis itself. Uh, it should be under, I believe, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, someone in the comments who knows WordPress a little better than me, it should be when you go under appearance there, uh, themes as opposed to under plugins. But I am far from a WordPress expert, just set up my first WordPress site uh, in years. Um, if you keep teasing recently. it, we're going to have to share it with everyone. That's I mean, it's what terrible, it's erichockberger.com. <laughs> Anyone is welcome to go to it. There's just no content on it. Okay. Uh, so it's fine, it's just, uh, yeah, someone in the comments, I think, could give a better instruction on update. Yes, uh, and if people are having issues updating, they should email into trellis at mediavine.com, correct? Definitely. You can also post in the Facebook group. We can probably put together a post in the Facebook. Oh, Amy says you're at your spot on. That's exactly where it was. Uh, Brock says, just click updates. Fantastic. Okay, follow-up question on trellis. In terms of child themes, we've had a lot of questions in the past about having... Um, third-party developers developing on top of Trellis. And I was told by our new VP of product, which we will talk about a little bit more later, that part of what we're doing in terms of making this more stable is enabling third-party developers to come in and build things on top of the framework. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, so again, when we were talking about before is once we release this 0.14 and we, and we make a stable API, then anyone who has developed a theme against it won't have to update their theme again. 
Uh, so I think a lot of developers have been waiting for this and that's what we've been getting the hands on was an early version of this 0.14 to a bunch of these developers. They're waiting on a little bit of documentation. Uh, and this has been on us. We need to work closer with the developer community now that we're getting closer to launch. Uh, so we're really hoping to get more third-party theme support out. I know there's already a couple of them out there. A lot of people have done custom themes, very exciting stuff, but we wanna make sure we get some major, uh, major theme developers behind this so that we can give you guys the variety you want. And again, when you see, um, when you load the media vine corporate site, you are looking at a custom build on top of Trellis. It is on Trellis. It doesn't necessarily look like some of the themes that you've seen, but you're looking at Trellis. So it's very exciting. Gavin says, loving Trellis, just installed last week. Is it possible to see status of Trellis Im image conversion? Uh, at the moment, no, uh, but that's a great piece of feedback. I think right now it just kind of works. We try to make it as simple as possible. You turn it on, it just kind of works in the background. Uh, and especially make sure you're running the latest version that just came out, because I know that fixed issues with a few hosts. Uh, make sure you're running that one. And then it should just hopefully automatically happen, but that's a good point. Uh, there should be a good way to, to check on that. Trellis Images is the best, says Elena. Elena's updating. Um, other people are so excited I'm able to catch a live for once. Love Trellis, says Kelly. Gavin says, loving Trellis. We're getting a lot of Trellis love, and we are happy to hear that, and we are very excited that coming soon, this summer we'll be able to release to everybody and it's going to be awesome. We're very thrilled about it. Well, Jenny so, gave you a date. Perfect. Summer. I don't that know. was not a date. I said summer. I said summer. That's broad. It's so broad. This also, summer? Next summer? It could be. It could be. No, I'm kidding, it guys. Um, all right. So Sarah asked the question about Core Web Vitals, but before we get to Sarah's specific Core Web Vital question, can you give us a little overview about what Core Web Vitals is and why everyone is freaking out about it? We had a live on this a couple of months ago. Google luckily was also freaking out a little bit and postponed the date. So tell us what Core Web Vitals are and why everybody cares. So there's a new Google algorithm coming or new signal to the Google algorithm uh, called Page Experience. and. Of that, they're now revamping the way that they define page speed. And there's now actual defined metrics, which is very exciting. There's three of them that we need to worry about. There are three acronyms. Uh, there is LCP, largest contentful paint. Uh, that says how quickly the largest object in the first screen view loads. There's first input delay. You really don't have to worry about that. We like to call it a freebie because almost everyone we see is passing it. It's like putting your name on the SATs. You get, you get one out of three. Most likely, if you have a fast site, I shouldn't say everybody hits that one. Uh, and that's just how quickly uh, the first time someone taps on your site or clicks a link or clicks a button, how quickly it responds. You should be passing that one if you have a fast site. And then the third one is the big one, which is cumulative layout shift or CLS. Uh, and that's the one that people are running into issues. And that's how much your page shifts around as it's loading. Unfortunately, there's a lot of page speed tricks like lazy loading of images, of ads, of whatever it may be that cause your page to shift or delaying uh, or deferring of CSS, all sorts of geeky things I could talk about, but CLS is one of the hard ones to hit. And you need to hit all three of them and all three need to be passing. It's a pass fail. So it's been a challenge. It has been. And we also have some conflicting um, conflicting stuff going on out there in the groups, which I know is shocking because everyone always agrees on Facebook groups. So I'm not sure why anyone would be different in this circumstance. But we have a, some conversations happening around saying that it's not necessarily that important, that Core Web Vitals aren't that important, that trying to pass them is not is impossible and therefore it's not worth trying. What are our thoughts on that? Uh, I think we, we probably overstress as publishers to hit every single thing that Google tells us to hit. Uh, I mean, with good reason, because so much of their algorithm is secretive. The second they tell us, here's one of our signals, here's how to pass it, we all obsess, right? Uh, it is just one of many factors. So if you have great content, uh, there's still a chance you can rank, obviously, without passing core web vitals. Most major news publications are failing core web vitals. Uh, a lot of your competition is probably failing core web vitals. So if you're both failing, uh, that's fine. You guys will probably not have your rankings individually move relative to each other. Uh, but there might be some of your competitors that are passing, and they were close with you within ranking those people might jump ahead of you as a result of this. So you're gonna see small ranking fluctuations. It's not gonna completely alter your life. Your site won't completely change in traffic come June or July. So I think that's probably why people are saying it's not the most important thing, but it is something you have direct control over. 
And I can promise you working on all of those core web vitals will also improve your revenue, your user experience and everything else. So time you're putting into it isn't just for Google. Uh, it is also for your site and for your revenue. It's specifically things that are impacting the experience of every person that comes to visit your website. Right. Like it's the stuff that we all have private conversations about at Mediavine. Like it really pisses me off when X happens when I'm on a website. That's what these things are addressing. The reason why we click the back button, these things are talking about that when you visit a site. So so it's 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 really cool that Google has actually given us metrics. They're hard, but they're actual things that they're they're goals. Okay, we have a couple of questions here. Sarah's original question was for Eric, what does it mean if I seem to be passing Core Web Vitals on mobile, but not desktop according to Search Console? We have a couple so that's, of those. Yeah, that's pretty common. Um, so we see that actually a lot. So uh, we're also monitoring, by the way, everyone's Core Web Vitals uh, in the back end. Uh, pretty fun fact, uh, everyone's Core Web Vitals are actually public uh, in the, the API. So you can go and pull anyone's Core Web Vitals just so you could do a page speed test on anyone's. So we're just kind of monitoring and seeing how many people are passing. And it's an impressive number, uh, we think, relative to the rest of the web. I keep seeing different stats, but now the latest one is less than 3% are passing all three core web vitals. I saw that the uh, other day too, yeah. That seemed like a crazy low number. I thought it was closer to 20 was the original number people were saying, uh, but it's very low. Uh, and we're seeing in a higher number than that, obviously, here at Mediavine, especially since our optimized ads for CLS fix went out. It's possible. We know there are hundreds of sites that we, we have seen doing it here at Mediavine. So, it, it, and you can see in the groups, people are posting their passing scores. You can see the Hollywood gossip is. Uh, but with many of them, we only see them passing mobile and not desktop. You go back to the original question, which is actually okay, because Google's initially rolling this out for mobile first. Uh, they did say that page experience is coming to desktop later. So you should certainly still work on it. But the good news is uh, you, you bought, bought yourself another few months of stress-free because uh, you don't have to fix it yet. Okay, so desktop and mobile are two different beasts. We know that mobile is more important because that's where the majority of lifestyle sites traffic is coming from. Google is prioritizing it in terms of their ranking factors. We know all of that. Now, when we talked about the three acronyms, the one that is most impacted by Mediavine is CLS because as ads load based on our lazy loading, all the things that we do to help make sites fast and help ads suck less cause issues with CLS. There is a feature that Mediavine has put out, which is not related at all to Trellis. It's just for all Mediavine publishers. Can you talk about those features that we're, we provide to everyone? Yeah, so first off, the reason why LCP and FID, the first two are not a problem at Mediavine, is from those first two optimized for page speed settings we released, I don't know, two, three years ago now at this point. Uh, make sure you're running those because that is the only way you're gonna pass those, those first two core web vitals. If you're running those, uh, then one of the things is because we do lazy, we always lazy load, but because more things are lazy loaded when uh, you're running those settings or in general, actually here at Mediavine, uh, you will see what's called CLS. And again, that is what happens when an ad loads and moves the rest of the page uh, below it. So if you optimize ads for CLS, which is just a quick little checkbox or a toggle inside of our dashboard, it will basically reserve the space needed for each ad to load. So it'll put a little uh, gray box where the ad would be or where the ad is going to be. Uh, make sure also running, by the way, PSAs, our public service announcements, so that there's not just a blank gray box if there's no ad to fill there. Instead, there'll be one of the awesome uh, PSAs you can help support. Uh, and there, there's a second option as well, and that is the optimize your sticky sidebar, which is essential if you want to be able to pass desktop CLS. Uh, so you're actually going to want to turn on both. Uh, if you want to make sure you're passing mobile and desktop for CLS. And it will be very challenging to pass without those options. But just to be also perfectly clear, what those settings will do is help you with your ads. That is not the only thing that is causing these issues. So just because you've checked those doesn't mean, it just means we're taking the things out of the way that cause, that ads are causing. Right. Uh, we should note, so Mediavine never loads ads in the first screen view. Uh, that has been something I've been pretty adamant about since we started Mediavine because my background is SEO. Uh, and one of the big things in SEO is not having ads in the first screen view. Google literally says this uh, as one of their ranking factors, uh, the page layout one. So make sure uh, when you're measuring your site, you're looking at the first screen view for CLS in uh, the lab results of PageSpeed Insights. And if you see any number above zero, uh, that's your site, not your Mediavine ads. Mediavine ads will cause no CLS in the first screen view. 
uh, because we load no ads in the first screen view. So what you wanna make sure you're doing is passing that, and then you more than likely will pass CLS uh, for your whole site, as long as that number is zero for the first screen view, uh, as long as, again, if you're running the Mediavine uh, optimized ads for CLS. Because then as a user scrolls, if the first screen view had no CLS, chances are the rest of your site is not going to. And I say that with a big caveat, because other things can cause CLS uh, throughout your site, even if your ads are solved. Also, if you're doubting whether or not, or you have someone that you're working with that's telling you it's your ads that's causing your CLS and you to not pass Core Web Vitals, you can kill switch those ads and run an, a test and see right. if that's what's causing it, correct? Eric, how do you do that? Uh, you can add a what's called a query string parameter to the end of the URL, so that's a question mark, test equals kill switch. And it will show your page without running anything to do with Mediavine. Our code just aborts, no, our code does not run, uh, no one can blame anything related to Mediavine at that point. Uh, it's then your developer's turn to actually fix everything. Uh, and that will show you the list of what right. you need to have them do. Correct. Okay, are we ready to, uh, we've got a whole lot of questions going here. I'm gonna, I was wanted to finish with Core Web Vitals before we started attacking all of the other things, but here we go. Here's a, here's a Trellis question, it's from Maria. Do you, rec do you recommend paginating comments on Trellis? Uh, so the way Trellis works is it actually uh, lazy loads all of your comments as is. Uh, so I don't think pagination is gonna have much of an impact because of the way that we lazy load uh, comments. At least it, it shouldn't. There's already, it's like a, almost like an infinite scroll experience. Trellis child theme question from Sarah. I think you said something about not needing to update the child theme. My team is concerned about updating Bamboo because we have some customizations. Uh, if the only reason you'll need to update it, uh, if you've already customized it, is if you want any of the new Bamboo features or any of the features uh, that come out in Trellis, uh, that are new at this point. Um, so you just want to have your theme developer take a look at the changes we've made. Uh, you don't have to update it and just see if they want to incorporate any of those. Okay, this is the quick one. And I think Tim needs, so it says, does your website have to use WordPress? I think that he means to work with Mediavine. This is one we've been answering this one for years. Eric. Uh, so most, almost every single ad feature we build at Mediavine are for all sites. Uh, and we do that on purpose because, well, our own sites currently are still not on WordPress. The Hollywood gossip itself is not on WordPress. And guess what? Uh, we wanted to make money. So it, all the features we build uh, as much as we can are never built for WordPress specifically. Uh, when it comes to Trellis, though, that is one of our WordPress plugins, or in this case, a theme. So yes, that will require WordPress. But the optimized ads for CLS, as we mentioned, that will work on a non-WordPress site. And again, and we have proof of the Hollywood gossip. Uh, it is. It's, it's still on. What, what, is, what is the Hollywood gossip on, Eric? Uh, the Hollywood gossip is on a CMS that I built that I guess mm -hmm. we just call Eric Press at this we point. Mm -hmm. We do. Uh, it wasn't the original name of it, but it's an adorable nickname that has stuck. Uh, it's pretty fast, though, still kept up with the times, even though I have little to no time to update it. Passes core web vitals, all that matters. Uh, Eric Press. It is Eric not Press. coming soon to a no. store near you. Brock Gates, we have a couple of questions on this one. Brock asked one, and we have one from Vidar. Any update on accepting smaller sites? I have one at 19,000 sessions that I'm dying to get into Mediavine. Uh, so we have uh, a new ad offering coming for publishers under 50,000. Uh, the goal for the initial launch is to be for 25,000 and above, with plans to lower it. Uh, so hopefully by the time it comes out, you'll be at 25,000, you will be eligible for that one. Uh, we don't have a defined date yet, but we are working on everything that we need to, to be able to launch that new ad offering. Uh, so that involves a, a new application process that you'll see launching soon, which includes uh, some changes that Google is having uh, all channel partners make. So not just Mediafine, but everyone who monetizes with Google. So we're making sure that we have everything in place before we launch this new uh, offering and it's still hopefully uh, this year is the goal. Yes, uh, we are. We will. We are working towards that, and we will definitely keep you updated on it. I, I can promise you personally that as soon as that is available, we will be screaming from every possible rooftop there is. Rest assured. Adrian says, "When is the option to use your own banners in the PSA spots? Can you explain just real quickly why we want to use PSAs in the first place with regard to Core Web Vitals, Eric? Just one more time." Yeah, so again, we 
basically reserve the space that you're going to need uh, for an ad. So previously, we have never done 100% fill. Uh, we do that because we set a minimum price for your ad inventory or a, what's called a floor. And we set a different floor based upon a whole number of factors to make sure though that your inventory is worth what it is. It's the re one of the reasons why Mediavine uh, ads are the highest paying in the industry. So you want us to have that, trust us. Uh, but the problem is one of the things is we used to just hide the spot if an ad uh, wasn't loaded. But then what happened was our good friends at Google said you can't collapse after the page load or that will cause CLS. So what we have to do now with our CLS fix is reserve the space. So whether an ad is gonna render there or not, we have to take up that space, we can't collapse it. Uh, so you wanna make sure you have a PSA or an ad serving in that place. Uh, and that's why you should opt into one of ours. Uh, as far as your original question goes, whether uh, when we're gonna give you the ability to upload your own banners, I know it's coming soon, um, but just being realistic, knowing all the other things that are happening, uh, you're gonna first see, the, like let's say our ad offering for smaller publishers, more than likely coming before uh, the ability to upload your own house ads. Speaking of that gray box, says Michelle Price, thank you, Eric, for sharing the CSS to change it to a white box yesterday. It looks so much better on my site. For anybody wondering uh, what options we now have for PSAs, and we are adding them constantly, we have some to help uh, to call specific attention to the situation in India right now with regard to COVID. As much as we want it to be over, it is not over. It is definitely not over there and the need is dire. So those are right there. They're in your dashboard, turn them on. We have the United Way 411. We have Ad Council, which includes Alzheimer's, empowering girls in STEM, high blood pressure, teen suicide prevention, and texting and driving prevention. We have Cookies for Kids Cancer. We have Operation Gratitude. We have Encouraging Pet Adoption, Adopt, Don't Shop. We have, again, our general COVID-19, and then we have No Kid Hungry. We are adding more and more. We have another exciting one coming out for June for Pride Month, so stand by for that one. There are tons of options, and if you have specific organizations that you are interested in us pursuing or talking to, email into shine at mediavine.com. We are here to take those suggestions and do what we can to make it happen. The Shine team is working hard on that one. Elena says, thank you so much for all you're doing to support us. I turned on all the things. We love that. Thanks, Elena. Kelly said, feel free to ignore if this isn't relevant. It's so relevant, Kelly. We would never ignore you. I just disabled the non-sticky sidebar ad because it was jittery and moving the widgets up and down before loading the ad. Is this a common problem? I wasn't sure if the revenue hit was worth possibly passing CLS. Um, so one of the things we've actually done with Trellis is much like we do the placeholder ads inside of your content now with the uh, the optimized ads for CLS is Trellis will reserve the space uh, starting with 13.1 for those sidebar ads. Uh, and so you could do the same if you're not running Trellis on your own site. Um, you'd have to email in to support if you want advice or you can check out how we do it on one of our Trellis sites. Uh, but basically you would set a, a height in uh, your theme for where that widget would be. And that would probably be your only way to solve CLS with it. Otherwise, just by the nature of it being an ad up high, it's gonna cause CLS otherwise. So I would probably remove it if it were me, if you don't, or uh, add that height. Amy says, I could be dreaming, but I thought you said on a talk a few months ago that you'd make a guide on how to make a custom homepage with Trellis and Gutenberg blocks. Just wondering if that was still coming. Just a dream. No, we're, we're working on it. Um, it's our dream too, I promise you. So what we have is, I'll just spoil it now, we have a, a plugin called Trellis Blocks coming out. And Trellis Blocks are gonna be basically Gutenberg blocks that are built and designed for the Trellis Child themes. Uh, and one of those things is gonna be homepage layouts because this is actually just built into WordPress. You can select from an option and it will basically give you uh, a sample template you can use as a homepage. So we decided rather than doing a guide, we were gonna make it uh, a little, little more built in, a little better. So Trellis Blocks, hopefully coming soon. Eugene says, wondering, why is RPM this time of year so high, like 65 to $68? It's not the end of the quarter, but still. Uh, I have been internally nicknaming it Maybember, and I've been trying to figure this out myself. It's, it's a good time of the year right now. Uh, we have a lot of optimizations that have obviously gone in. Uh, and I mean, some of it is obviously seasonal. We're right around the holiday coming up, and then it will, unfortunately, after Memorial Day, drop a little bit, just the nature. We have that cool little chart we should link to in the blog, uh, on the blog. Uh, but yeah, some of it is just literally things are killing it right now. We have a lot of great stuff we've been, release, been releasing over the last several years that are really paying off. We actually have that guys that um, it's it's the uh, 
the extension of um, VP of Ad Ops, Brad Hagman's Ad Revenue by the Seasons. It's a daily heat map for 2021. We have a chart for it. He recommends that you print it out and put it on your refrigerator. Um, but you do whatever you do, whatever makes you happy. <laughs> Our designers made it and it shows you the different heats for, for when things are hot. And we're in a hot time right now. Okay. Kippy says, so you will be offering new Mediavine users for only 25,000 sessions. Um, that is going to be our goal. We're trying to release. It's not going to be the same Mediavine ad offering. It's going to be a new ad offering. It won't be significantly different, powered by the same tech. You'll hopefully be able to make around the same amount of money. Uh, but they're going to be slightly different ad offerings. Uh, but the goal is, yeah, that's going to start off at 25,000 sessions a month, um, or at least pretty quickly after launch. Brock says, will they include schema FAQs? I'm not sure what they are, but uh, probably the trellis blocks. I'm guessing when we said that one. Uh, so right now, I think there's just so many different ways to do uh, facts. I know like Yoast and there's a whole bunch of ones that people already use it. I don't know if that was one of the first things we tackled. Uh, we actually built this for create true story and never even released it just because we weren't sure if it was necessary just because there's so many other people that built ways to do facts. Um, something that might come to one of our plugins for sure, but I would recommend looking into the, one of the other ones right now. Maybember is now trending in our comments. <laughs> um, so we've, we've created another uh, another term. So uh, also charcuterie summer, it's, it's a really eventful live. Uh, Adrian says, when are integrations coming for grow.me? Will it allow webhooks or Zapier only? So this is a great segue, thank you, Adrian, into talking about grow.me. So let's talk about that. He wants to know more about uh, what the integrations are coming for Spotlight Subscribe and uh, Spotlight and the Subscribe widget, Spotlight widget and Subscribe. Spotlight Subscribe, Subscribe widget, whatever you want to do. Uh, so just the quickest of overview for Grow.me, if any of you have somehow missed us rambling about it for the last, I don't know, six months. Uh, Grow.me is our answer to help you build first party data with uh, the end of third party cookies. So incredibly important that everyone adopts Grow.me as soon as they can. It's in beta, give us your feedback, such as Adrian's where we had a lot of people that are, love our what's called our subscribe or our spotlight subscribe, which is a non pop up uh, like experience that uh, as you scroll on a page, it kind of grays out the rest of the page and highlights this subscribe uh, sign up and it converts incredibly well for an inline widget, unlike anything you've ever seen. Uh, not quite up to modal or pop-up levels because that is uh, very hard to beat without stopping the user dead in their tracks and making them basically fill that out before they move on. We don't love that experience, so we built what's called Spotlight Subscribe. Currently, uh, it gives you the email addresses of people that sign up uh, in a CSV or a file you have to download and then upload to your uh, mail provider. We quickly got the feedback from our publishers. They did not love that. Uh, time-consuming process. So what we're building right now is a Zapier or a Zapier, Zapier to make you happier. Uh, I have to say that in my head every time. Uh, a Zapier integration is gonna be our first one. And that's just because that will get us the most number of providers right out the gate. Almost everybody has a Zapier integration that we can have people uploading to all of their different ESPs uh, within you know hours of when we release the feature versus trying to have to match each and every ESP. And webhooks is going to be a similar thing that it's very technical and I'm not sure that everyone will even have the same standard. So it just might be a little more uh, involved. And so I can't promise webhooks are coming. I can't promise any direct ESP integrations are coming, but Zapier is coming very soon. Awesome. We have some great feedback here. I love Spotlight Subscribe. I can't wait for the integration with email services. The newsletter conversion is amazing. Just need an integration to MailChimp. Love Spotlight Subscribe. Uh, I love the grow.me sign up option. It's the only opt in I use now, says Vicky. We have, this is a great question. My feedback, it, well, it's not really a question. It's a statement that I will turn into a question. My feedback is that I'd like to be able to get grow.me on my non media my new site. Uh, yeah, no, we'd love to be able to get it there. Um, our goal is generally uh, with grow.me is to get it on as many sites as possible in the future. We think uh, as it becomes more ubiquitous of a of a reader experience, our readers are used to seeing it across the entire internet, it's gonna do better. There's a lot of value to a reader in having a grow.me account, or there's going to be, and it's only increased the more sites that are running it. So our goal is to have grow.me on non-Mediavine sites in the future. Uh, we can't promise you when that's coming, but right now during the beta, it's exclusive to our Mediavine publishers uh, because we're giving it to all of you guys for free. Uh, and obviously 
we have to figure out ways to monetize uh, Grow.me when it goes beyond media buying publishers. So this is a question for all the audience. Grow.me users, what features are your audiences engaging with the most? What would you like to see us add to the product moving forward? We're getting a lot of love for Spotlight Subscribe and a lot of great conversions. We are working on different integrations for that one. It's coming up as soon as we can. Um, but we'd love to hear more from you guys and hear more what your suggestions are. We we haven't said third party cookies in this live, but maybe we should. That's why we care about this. That's why it's important is that uh, we don't need to say it again. They're going away, we know. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important that we are building out this feature set now with your feedback, knowing what's gonna work for your audience. I would like to talk about a blog post that we had to go out a little earlier this week. It is about um, the results we've been seeing with what what is used to be a pretty controversial feature for us and now isn't so much anymore, which is jump to recipe or jump to card. Um, we we have a, a pretty awesome solution for that that will not destroy viewability and revenue. So I'd love to talk about the um, the arrival unit and what's going on. Yeah, so I think one of the great things about uh, you'll see in the blog post is that we built a handful of optimizations, not just the arrival unit, to make sure that when a reader clicks jump to recipe, it's not destroying your site's viewability because if you destroy your site's viewability, uh, you hurt your long-term earning potential uh, because buyers don't come back to buy on your site if you have a low viewability. Uh, and that's what we were, we were seeing happening. Our food blogs had about a 50% lower viewability than non-food blogs, if you can believe that. Uh, and so it was very much hurting their earning potential. Uh, so we built exclusive technology, thanks to the fact we lazy load your ads. When someone clicks jump to recipe, we actually don't load the ads in the content they're skipping. Uh, a few ads may get loaded because it happened at the very beginning of the article, but most of them are gonna end up just not loading. So we don't load an ad that a user would never have seen. Uh, and then they get down to what we call the arrival unit, uh, so it's an optional ad unit that performs incredibly well, especially if you have uh, short form recipes that don't have a lot of other ad units in them. Uh, and then we added in addition to that arrival unit, which is a great performing ad unit, uh, the ability to serve multiple ads in the card. So that works for Create, for WP Recipe Maker, and for WP Tasty. So basically the three largest recipe cards uh, are all now optimized by this ad technology. And the exciting findings, I'll spoil the blog post, when a user clicks jump to recipe, you make 15% more revenue uh, if you're running all these op optimizations, 15% uh, more revenue. You used to make less revenue and hurt your viewability. Now your viewability is no longer impacted because you remove those ads and you make more thanks to all those ad optimizations. So we are finally of the opinion, uh, yes, you should in fact turn it on. Uh, you won't necessarily make more money even though those users are making you more. Uh, you'll end up making around the same amount of money as what our findings are. It just basically shifts your revenue from content ads over to recipe ads. Okay, so this used to be controversial largely for us because of what the impact was on viewability and revenue. The other side of that coin was that we were never able to, as a company founded on SEO, conclusively prove that a jump button has a good impact on SEO. What is all of the impact on SEO? Because those are the things I keep hearing about people talking about in all the groups is SEO, my SEO, and then even using the arrival unit is bad for SEO. All right, well, first, um, I just want to start this off because this is an interesting uh, controversy that doesn't make sense. Uh, Google doesn't press buttons. Google does not click buttons on your site. Uh, you can read, directly on Google's website that you can hear from John Muir and other uh, Google employees that will say Google will not click on your buttons. So quote, uh, Google will not click on buttons, the, the, the exact wording from them. So Google is not clicking on your jump to recipe. So when people say there's an SEO benefit, what they're really saying is the improved user experience is going to indirectly help your SEO. Why? Because more users who uh, enjoy your site are more likely to share it on social. They're more likely to link to it. They're more likely to do things that will actually improve your SEO long-term. So the adding of a button does not impact your rankings directly. Because again, Google does not click on buttons. I can't say this any more times. Uh, the arrival unit, the argument, I guess, is that if it's enough of a worse experience than not running the arrival unit, uh, maybe some people won't link to your site. 
I think encourage you to use the arrival unit on your site and then compare it to not running any jump button at all. That's what you should be comparing. Is a jump button with arrival unit a better user experience than no jump button? It is a thousand percent better. Is having an arrival unit versus no arrival unit a better user experience? That's the argument of just not running ads at all. Turn all ads off your site and maybe you'll have a better user experience, 100%. But you're not in this business to just give out free content. So everything you do has to be a pro and a con. You have to weigh these things. Uh, it is a balance between user experience and revenue. In our case, we are very confident the arrival unit is a better user experience uh, than, again, with combined with jump than not jump, and not a significantly worse one than running a jump without arrival. So we would recommend running it, especially if you have short form recipes, you're going to see a big jump uh, in your RPM. Uh, Gavin says, loving the jump to recipe link vastly improves user experience for people who do not want to read all the content. We'll see in time when it does to RPMs, definitely. Um, okay, here's a great question. Should we make our jump to recipe buttons prominent again? So I think when we first added jump to recipe with create, we didn't have all the ad optimizations in, we had a bunch of them. Uh, and so we had kind of that more subtle option. I think it was just called like the text link. And I think that was the one we were encouraging, which was go a little more subtle, right? Uh, your readers who want to find it will find it. At this point, again, those people make you more money when they click it. So don't worry. Uh, if you want to go with a more obvious button, it's not going to have a bad impact to your RPM. Again, assuming you're running the multiple ads per recipe card and you have uh, the arrival unit on. Uh, all those numbers can't not be guaranteed if you run only one ad in your recipe card, you turn off the arrival unit. All right, Adrian said, Adrian is really like killing it in terms of like segueing from point to point. <laughs> I'm, I'm very appreciative of him, he's a great co-host. Adrian says, you already have a lot of upcoming amazing features announced. I wondered if there was anything that it wasn't yet announced. Well, actually, Adrian, Let's start out with um, something called Mobile InView. That's a great idea. Thank you, Adrian, for that, that segue. He's great. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we have a, a pretty cool new feature that we are beta testing right now on just a handful of internal websites. It's something we're calling the Mobile InView, uh, and it's built to improve the viewability, hence its name, of your in-content units and your recipe units uh, throughout uh, mo the mobile experience only. I should mention that. And the way it basically works, and you can check it out now in the Hollywood Gossip, you can go on your phone as you're scrolling, uh, using that uh, placeholder, that gray box that we added for optimized for CLS. Uh, we now use it as kind of a sticky rail, uh, which is a gross word, I guess I probably shouldn't have used, but basically the ad will stick throughout that gray box. So as you're scrolling, it will stick to the top for a little bit. Uh, that is coming out hopefully uh, in the next uh, month or so. One of the things we have to do is there's a lot of things, obviously, that are uh, fixed or sticky on your page right now. If you're running Grow.me, if you're running the, the video player, if you're running our adhesion, and we want to make sure that we create a good user experience. Uh, so one of the things we're working on with the InView is making sure that all of your Mediavine fixed or sticky uh, options all play well together. Uh, and so that's one of the things we're working on. So we're asking right now, actually, for beta testers, if we want to share the link, um, for people to sign up and help us test the in view to make sure it works across all the different sites out there because it, uh, it it does require some wizardry that our programmers came up with. We want to make sure it doesn't uh, conflict with your site. And again, all those other sticky options you want to make sure are working well. So just quick caveat, we are sharing the link for beta testers. You will be able to see a beautiful example of what the unit looks like when you click on to this Google form that we have created. Caveats. Just because you sign up does not mean that you will be a beta tester. There are a ton of different things that go into making our testing profiles. So we can't guarantee that you'll be in just because you sign up, but we do appreciate you. If you're, if you're willing to do this, please do sign up. And the feature might not work with every single site because of CSS related issues. So, so as Eric was explaining, there are a million different variables here that can cause something to not be the best fit for your site. However, we put the link in there Hop in, it's not a Google form, it's an Airtable. Go to the Airtable survey and drop your drop your information in if you're interested in signing up. We would love to have you. Okay, so let's go back to another thing that we have that we will be kicking out next week. It is called the desktop interstitial. It's another controversial thing. We just keep dropping them. Oh man. Talk about the desktop interstitial. Doing all the fun stuff today. 
Thank you, Adrian. I'm, I'm, I'm blaming Adrian himself for all these. Uh, uh, he actually you. wanted to just clarify that he is a paid media mind shill for anyone wondering. Oh, so. perfect. Okay. Then why do you bring up desktop interstitial? No, I'm kidding. Um, so we <laughs> have the mobile interstitial that we released a couple months ago now, maybe a few months ago, maybe longer. Time is whatever, as we said, lost track of it a while ago. Uh, and basically what it is, is after a user clicks a, a link on your page or goes to a second page view, there's now an interstitial or a full screen ad between the page views. This is uh, Google search compliant on mobile because they are built by Google themselves. They perform incredibly well. So if you have a site that gets a lot of second page views, uh, some people are making just a ton of money on the mobile interstitial. And so Google saw this as well, and they released now a desktop version. And so Mediavine is going to make that option for publishers that still have desktop traffic. There's like five of you out there. If you still have a lot of desktop traffic and you happen to get second page views, uh, this is, again, that same kind of opportunity. You might be able to expect uh, like a 7 to 10% increase to your desktop RPM. If you get those second page views, It'll a lot of them, it'll be even higher. Uh, and if you have a lot of desktop traffic, this could be some serious money. However, caveat, it is not the best user experience. I will be honest, I don't love interstitials. I'm sure most of your readers don't either. I think the thing we hate the most here are email subscribe pop-ups and that kind of stuff. Interstitial is certainly no better. It's the same kind of concept. It stops your flow dead in the tracks and you have to acknowledge it. That's why they perform so well, uh, but you've got to make that decision for yourself. We just want to give you the option. Uh, just to be perfectly clear on all of this, you said Google is doing this because there was a whole lot of uh, Google not loving this not that long ago. Yeah, so to be clear, Google has only ever cared about mobile interstitials. They've always allowed desktop ones, which is why we've always had kind of desktop pop-ups. So this one would have been compliant no matter what, but uh, it is still built to Google's uh, standards for mobile interstitials, which are only at between page views. So you can never do it on the first page view. You can do it on the second page view. You could do it between the page views. This is technically, I guess, uh, between. Uh, you can do it for a lot of reasons to have a pop-up. You can do a CMP or uh, our cookie uh, consent. When you first get to uh, a site in Europe, you're allowed to do those for pop-ups. There certainly are exceptions, but the inter interstitials are 100% uh, to Google standards because, well, they made them themselves. Okay. We've got Ellen saying she's got 20% desktop traffic here, so it might be worth, you know? You don't know. It's up to you. It's it's your call. Uh, Michelle says, is there any updated data on the mobile interstitial like you have for Jump to Recipe? I had added it, but I saw my session count go down significantly, so I took it off months ago. Uh, we never saw a real significant drop to sessions, but we can pull that data. That's a, that's a great question. We'll compare people running the mobile interstitial to non over the same time period and see uh, if we can find any. Uh, factors. That's a good idea for a blog post in the future. Okay. Uh, we have someone say, I hated the interstitial. I felt like it froze on a weird ad page and was very confusing to you and our users seemed extremely spammy and people, including myself, just X'd out. I mean, yeah. it's kind of what it is. That's It does go to an odd page and it does make you go, what is this? I've done it myself as a user on my phone. Mm -hmm. I mean, what What is this? Um, so it's, I think that some of the weird confusion about what it actually is will probably dissipate as more people are using it. Um, mm -hmm. But that won't necessarily take away the personal bleh when you run it. That's a well, it's optional and certainly yeah. not under recommended here at Mediafine. Yes, not recommended, just an option that we're presenting to you because it was presented by Google. So we're saying mm -hmm. it's, it's there and these are the results that we've seen from it. We got it nominated for an award. I think most people saw it, but in case they didn't, we're just going to talk about our nomination. We're happy just to be nominated. It's like an Oscar for us. It is a first party data strategy. Grow.me was nominated. It's a brand new category from Digiday. Eric, tell us a little bit about why Grow.me getting nominated was important to us. So first off, it was also Digiday's first year of having a first party data award or first party data strategy. And the reason why is because first party data has always been a thing we've talked about in the industry, but now it is probably the most important thing we're talking about in the industry. Because when third party cookies go away, uh, first party data strategy are going to be who basically survive or who make the most uh, money in the future. Uh, so it's incredible that um, to be recognized for this just because we were the only ad management company and really the only independent publishers. I think there's one other publishing company that even is there. And that's just to show you how few other people have first party data strategies right now or how many other uh, publishers. So 
we're excited that we're getting industry recognition. Um, but even more exciting is the fact that Grow.me is an actual first party data strategy available today that you are running as publishers when other people are still just talking about it on the internet. Uh, we're building stuff and we're building it with you, our publishers. That's more exciting than even the nomination. What is the advantage to turning on Grow.me now? Why? What's the point when there are still third party cookies out there? Right. So, well, first off, I love our favorite play, uh, playground we have, which is Safari. Um, besides the privacy playground, but the Safari test is live today. Safari killed third-party cookies years ago. So running grow.me today will make you more money on Safari and even having first-party data on a website uh, or on Chrome when there are third-party cookies is still worth a little bit more. So it's not gonna hurt you, it'll only help you. First-party data is good. It's uh, a lot of times a lot more reliable than third-party data as well. Um, so running grow.me, what it will do for you today, besides increasing your revenue a little bit uh, from when users log in, it's also going to help you create relationships with your readers. And that is really what first party data is about. It's about first party relationships. So that's what the subscribe widget is. That's what recommended content is. It's personalized to the reader when they log in. You recommend content from your site that will be interesting to that reader. Uh, we're building a lot of features like that we're trying to provide more value to your reader to encourage them to log in. Why are we giving, like we have to give them reasons or a value exchange of why they're willing to give us their data. They need to be rewarded or given something in exchange. That's the idea of a privacy centric web. People will choose to give up their data. We wanna make sure they have a reason to. Exactly. Um, and forming that relationship now and building those that first party data store now is only going to be good as opposed to starting from scratch when the cookies go away. If you're starting now, you're giving yourself ramp up time to build. Yes, Eric? Yeah, I mean, the, the best time obviously to start a first party data strategy be when you created your website. The second best time is today, as the expression goes or butchering of that expression. Uh, what you're gonna wanna do is turn on as soon as you can uh, because every day you're building that relationship with readers. Every day that someone subscribes, you're getting another grow.me user uh, to log into your website uh, and to hopefully stay logged in as they continue to come back to your site and they'll have other reasons again to log back in. That is what grow.me is doing. It's building additional features. So if you start today, when the third party cookie drops, it's not going to be a fall for you. Uh, it'll probably be equal or a, a raise. If you start building meaningful relationships with their readers today. If you start the day before third party cookies go away or the day after, uh, it's gonna be a fall and then it's gonna be a climb back up. Adrian just did it again. So I'm gonna go ahead and just, I had I had a follow up question. Just hired, let's do it already. It. So you believe Flock and major other initiatives will fail and it will end up depending on the publisher, publisher's first party data. Didn't say that Adrian, here's what we are saying. So uh, even Google themselves, and every time they introduce Flock or the privacy sandbox or talk about it, read every blog post of theirs. They talk about first party data and talk about how it's the most important thing. So the idea is you're actually gonna want both. Even Google says you want both. Uh, we are big proponents of Flock. We are probably the biggest proponents of Flock and privacy sandbox there is. We were the first live uh, test of Flock. That's actually live today. You can read the press release. Uh, we partnered with the Media Grid, one of the ad exchanges or SSPs we work with. We actually send Flock IDs as users are coming through Chrome, even as third-party cookies exist today, so we can help test the pipes, as they say in the industry, or making sure that people are able to transact on this. We believe in Flock wholeheartedly. We believe in the privacy sandbox, but that's only part of the solution. It's important to note that that won't fully replace the value of third-party cookies, uh, and that's where things like first-party data come in. Uh, some advertisers will want to be able to target different things. Flock doesn't give them the full targeting that they had with third-party cookies. First party data does, and sometimes it gives them more power. So you wanna combine the two efforts, so both. So yeah, the guys, the answer is like, we don't know, neither does Google. Nobody knows exactly how all this is going to shake out. So grow.me is designed to not only build that first party data to solve, but it's also designed to create a better user experience for your readers, to make it more enjoyable for them to browse. And all of this, is hedging against having to do what drives us all crazy about the New York Times, which is a paywall. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to keep from having to do that in order to keep you guys still able to monetize your websites, 
monetize the traffic that you've worked so hard for with with a privacy centric web but we don't know what it's going to be and i don't think google knows either we're we're all just kind of experimenting moving forward and we're hedging our bets by building up our own solution at the same time is that accurate yeah and and to be clear like we it's not even just privacy sandbox and just first party data we're also working on solutions like contextual uh, there's going to be other solutions that our industry will come up with as well so it's a handful of things and we have our own prototypes we're working on uh internally secretly here uh and not so secretly when we're members of the pre-bid single sign-on committee there's so many different ways that we're all coming about this as an industry the best thing we can do as your ad management company you can do as a publisher is going as many roads as possible uh, so whichever ones end up making it we will be happy that we bet on all of those horses and not just one uh, and in this case, first party data is the one that you need to help the most with. Uh, and that's what grow.me is for. What is contextual? Great question. Contextual is uh, kind of the old school way of doing ads. So how AdSense uh, works, where it basically reads the content of the page uh, and picks ads based upon uh, that particular page's uh, context, hence contextual. So the, the keywords you may be using or what you're writing about, the theme, the categories, uh, ads will serve based upon that. What are, Adrian said, last segue, amazing webinar. Thank you. Adrian, <laughs> you're the real MVP mm -hmm. of this hour. Thank you. Uh, and thank you guys for being here. We are almost out of time. It always goes fast when we're together. I wanted to quickly say next Wednesday, it is Wednesday, not Thursday. I'm saying it mostly for my benefit, not yours, because I will not remember. Wednesday, June 2nd is the first episode of the Summer of Live. We are so excited. We'll be going live every week over the summer. It is at 3 p.m. Eastern. That stays the same, 2 p.m. Central. We've got Amy Lucardo on, and she's talking five Pinterest secrets and how to gain traction from them. Uh, it is going to be amazing, and it's going to be informative. And who doesn't want talking about Pinterest? So we will be here next Wednesday for that. Eric, before we end season three of Summer of Live, are there any fun media vine goodies that you can tease before we say goodbye? Any any cool summer uh, releases or fall that you might want to share? Oh, now I feel like I. I got to I got to bring another one, another big secret. Um, no, I think another fun thing that we're working on is a solution for publishers that don't produce their own video right now, um, so that you don't have to rely on uh, emailing in and having us create a featured video for you. Uh, we have a pretty cool solution coming that uh, we're hopefully again going to be releasing in the next few weeks or months uh, that will make you a lot of money if you are not currently running video today. So that is exciting and also coming soon. More, more exciting things, as Eric said, that are double secret happenings that we will be revealing over the course of the summer. We are so happy that you guys are here. We want you to have an amazing Memorial Day weekend. Please join us for the summer of live and have a safe and wonderful holiday. Eric, thanks again for being here. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you everyone for listening, especially Adrian for uh, leading the conversation for us. Adrian totally led the conversation. We're going to share also our link document in the notes, which will have all of the relevant links from this live. So you can click around, read, get more information. And if you have questions, of course, we're always here. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day.